Well, welcome back to part two of Typing Assignment 22 Results. I've had to split the Typing Assignment Results video into two parts because the uh, overall length of both of them together would have been well over 45 minutes, a, a big, huge video to watch in one showing. So split it up into two parts. Hope you guys enjoyed part one. Here is the slideshow for part two. Hope you enjoy it. Well, I enjoy John Monroe's piece called Aunt Lizzie's Cosmic Jalopy. This was wonderful. Uh, he wrote it on a Facet TP1 in 1963, Facet TP1. Uh, John is a longtime participant and lives in Tokyo, Japan. And there is something very special about this story. John is a, a practicing Buddhist and is very adept at meditation. And this story takes place in a meditation retreat. But what's interesting about it, it's kind of a hallucinogenic vision, but there are aspects of this story that are very much like uh, William Gibson's science fiction, kind of the cyberpunk so-called science fiction. And because so much of William Gibson's science fiction took place in Japan, I can't help but think there's some kind of a connection here, at least indirectly. But I really love this. I love this hallucinogenic, multi-dimensional piece very good, John. And also, I gotta say, I really enjoy the edits that you included in here. The words crossed out in over on the uh, third paragraph, the circled word bubble that's inserted. I just love that. It sort of shows the mechanics of the writing process and the editing process. So, well done, John. I super enjoyed this, and I'm gonna have to reread this again. Andrew Nichols is a longtime participant in our project also, and he wrote his piece on a 1954 Gossen Tippa, and his piece is called Now She's Grown Up. And this is a bittersweet story. It's wonderful. Um, a man and his daughter, and he's lost his wife, his daughter's mother, and they're on a trip, a road trip, and he finally realizes that she's, his daughter is grown up, and uh, they just have this bonding moment early in the morning overlooking a cliff in their convertible roadster sharing their mutual loss and the fact that they have each other. It's just a wonderful story and I appreciate it Andrew. Thank you. Afternoon tea. Yes, sir. Got to do it. Okay, this next piece, A Summer Road Trip by longtime contributor David Randall. This was typed on a 1954 Royal Aristocrat. I love the Pacific Northwest. I spent a little bit of time up there in uh, early the early aughts, let's say. But uh, love the, the Seattle area, and this is a great piece. I certainly wish I was on this little trip. This is just a little uh, rendition of a several day trip that they took via ferry and automobile from their home 
down to the uh, Northwest Carriage Museum in Raymond, Washington. And I really love this. I loved your description of the carriages and the differences between them. And I was thinking how much of the automobile culture that we inherited from the carriage. Of course, you have the idea of the horseless carriage, but the mechanics of that are so interesting. And the fact that these carriages were a combination of animal, horse, right, and a mechanical contrivance. It was both. It was a combination, a hybrid kind of transportation, which we don't really have today anymore. Really enjoyed this a lot, and I certainly wish I was taking one of these ferry trips. And it reminds you how much you can have fun by just by taking an extra day off in a week. Take a Friday off, and you got yourself a great three-day weekend. David, I really love this. I wish I was on this trip with you guys. Sounds like a lot of fun. Well, Bradley Ryder, welcome to the Typing Assignments. Uh, he wrote his piece called Summer Vacation Troll Thief, and it was written on a Hermes 3000, wonderful machine, and I really love this piece. Uh, so he's just recalling a story when he was a child uh, on vacation down in the Somerset campgrounds of Maryland, and in Pocomoke City, he tells this story of having shoplifted a little troll earring figure off of a store window display and <laughs> the guilt he had from it and even years later now living in the same area he still has strange feelings when he drives by there and thinks about it thinks about his children of course and hope they don't become shoplifters but it reminds me um, when I was a kid we had a local five and dime store called duck walls and i think what we did is we would peel off the price tag of a less expensive item and put it on a more expensive item that we wanted and uh, that was our way of shoplifting of course nowadays uh, store owners have gotten wise to that and they have those price tags that are split in little parts so you can't just peel off the tag very easily but that was my childhood life of crime this was a really fun story bradley i really enjoyed it and <laughs> welcome to the series It tastes better when you slurp it. That's what I've learned. It aerates the liquid. You get more flavor out of it. Gregory Short, I believe, is a newcomer to the series. Also, welcome, Gregory. He wrote his piece, Summer Road Trips, on a 1962 Royal Companion. Gregory, I love your writing style. This kind of brief phrasing I really appeals to me. Uh, let me read a piece. Corn into houses. Houses into neighborhoods, neighborhoods into Peoria, the not Arizona one, the end of the road, the one with the ham sandwiches, lightning bugs glowing in clasped hands. That's wonderful. I really like this style of writing. You can fit so much of the story into a brief page using this technique, because I tend to be long-winded. I, I really think I am. I, I kind of I'm one of those guys that if I was in a writing class, like a beginning college writing class, the teacher would strike out half the stuff and say, you know, you're being too wordy. You don't need to describe everything like it's a movie. That's kind of the way I am. I'm more visual, cinematic, but I love this. This is more kind of prose, poetic, 
a lot of that. That's wonderful. I like this style. It's great. Thank you very much, Gregory. I look forward to more of your contributions. Dorian Suprina's piece, A Lovely Trip, was written on an Olympia Splendid 33, and this is a sweet story of meeting a young lady on a train. She tells him her story of having fallen in love with a guy, splitting up with him, and he gives her the advice to, you need to go back together with him, and she, in turn, gives him a kiss, and that kiss captivates him, and he says, still today, I don't know her name, but I can say that I gave her my first kiss to her. I'm still hoping that one day there will be a rendezvous in Split. The end. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. We will see. Classic love story, right? I love that. Thank you very much, Dorian. Thank you for your contribution. I look forward to more. Kid has been a contributor to this series before. Welcome back, Eric. And he wrote his piece on a royal safari. And this is one of these classic uh, vacations, summer vacations, again in South Carolina. And he recalls the story of his the three younger siblings in his family going on vacation. And this time uh, he finds, among other things, he finds a rock on the beach that he decides is going to be his pet rock. This is around the time when pet rocks were real popular. But his brother, those brothers, man, got to watch out for them brothers, convinces him that it's not an official pet rock and he needs to be paying him life insurance payments so it'll be an official pet rock. And of course, the story ends when he's due to pay his brother his the first life insurance payment. What a scam that is, man. Hitting up your little brother for life insurance money thats for your pet rock. That's pretty funny. This is a great story. And these kinds of trips, you know, are so filled with adventures and things happening that you'll remember the rest of your life. Like in this case, driving through that area where the forest fire is and all the smoke and watching those firefighters battle the flames. I remember we were driving out to uh, California a few years ago and on I-40, I think, somewhere, probably where I-40 turns into whatever, some other highway in California, anyway, there was a semi-tractor trailer on the side of the highway totally engulfed in flames. This is one of those super hot 115 degree Fahrenheit days, and it was just burning, and you could see that column of smoke in the rearview mirror for miles and miles after we passed it. But, uh, yeah, those little things happen, you know. Things happen on trips that you always remember, and this is a great example of that. Thank you, Eric.
Well, this next piece is written by my wife, Andrea, and it is titled Marfa, Marfa, Marfa. And it is written about our little vacation a few years ago that we took down to the little town of Marfa, Texas. Uh, this was written on an Olympia SG3, 1957 SG3, wonderful machine. My wife claims it's hers. I guess it is. So this was a great trip. I had been making noises for a few years about wanting to go to Marfa, Texas. I had read about it. I think there was an, an, an article in the New Yorker magazine a few years ago that really had me intrigued. This is a little West Texas small town. A lot of property in the town was bought up by a artist and gallery owner in, from New York City named Donald Judd. He uh, started the Shinati Foundation and built a number of art galleries, installation galleries in Marfa, and it's sort of become this West Texas arts destination. So we decided, my wife finally decided to go down there on one of our little April trips because she had seen a story about it on CBS 60 Minutes program and all of a sudden it attracted her. Well, we got down there. It's a seven hour drive from Albuquerque. It's down in the southwest corner of Texas by the Big Bend National Park area. But what we didn't know, and we left on a Sunday, what we didn't know is basically Sunday through Wednesday, the place is shut down. It's only like Thursday through Saturday that things are happening. So there was a beer garden open. <clears throat> there was a Dairy Queen, maybe a convenience store. That was it. So we just sort of looked around at empty galleries, looked through the windows at little shops that were closed. We wondered what would the late night grilled cheese emporium have been like if it had been open. I mean, this little place had video monitors, like the kind, the old broadcast black and white little CRT monitors and video cameras, things like an art installation and the late night grilled cheese emporium. Are you kidding me? We missed it. How about Food Shark? They had all these old 1970s beater muscle cars with Food Shark painted on the side. They must have been like delivery cars for people delivering restaurant food to people and all that. All that stuff was closed down, but we did go down to Alpine, the next community further south, where we actually could have lunch and actual real shopping. And yes, we did go out to the visitor center out on the highway to view the Marfa lights, but unfortunately, there were no lights to be seen. So... You know what? I still enjoyed that vacation. I enjoyed it just getting away. We like these funky little small trips, the, the road trips to some funky location, a little casita, a little house to stay in, just peace and quiet, get away from it all. That's what road trips are about. Great job, honey. Well, this next piece uh, was written by me. It's called A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to Roswell. Yeah, and this was written on a Canon Type Star 4, so this was the only thermally uh, typewritten piece, I believe. I remember a real-time trip we took. We were driving over to Roswell, and uh, you drive down I-25 from Albuquerque past Socorro, and you take this highway that runs from San Antonio to Carrizozo, basically runs west to east across the northern boundary of the White Sands Missile Range, and it's about 20-some miles from the Trinity site, uh, where the first atomic device was detonated in 1945. And if you go past Carrizozo, and there is a mountain pass that this highway leads through on the way out to Roswell, we were driving through that mountain pass and we saw these delta winged fighter planes several of them flying well below the mountain top level right through these canyons right by the highway 
Turns out they were Luftwaffe. The German Air Force has a squadron or had a squadron based in an Air Force base in New Mexico, and they would use it for training. So these were German uh, fighter planes. Anyway, that that kind of inspired this whole idea of driving to Roswell and, of course, Roswell, right? Flying saucers and all that. So anyway, it was a fun story to write, and uh, I... <laughs> I did enjoy it, but you know this particular uh, typewritten piece I wrote a few weeks ago, and it's been sitting here on the desk on the table for a while. And of course, I kind of like to do that with this thermal paper just to see how rugged it actually is, you know. But so there's a few wrinkles in it. Oddly enough, there isn't really any discoloration, like thermal discoloration. There's one little scratch here, up in the first paragraph that kind of puts a little line or a mark on it and some little brown mark that could be coffee stains or something. But overall, for the short term, it, it held up pretty well. So I hope you enjoyed that story. A little tongue-in-cheek flying saucer vacation road trip story. David Wells has been a frequent contributor to this series, and he wrote his piece on the Smith Corona 5 series. This is a great piece, uh, riding in a vacation on, in his grandpa's Winnebago down the seaboard to Florida, and how different it is, the generational difference, when you're living uh, for a time in someone else's motorhome, which is essentially like a mobile version of their house. You have to put up with their likes and dislikes, their polka music on 8-track. And uh, I love how you decide at the last moment there, yeah, I think I'm going to be traveling with Dad in the station wagon instead. And so it is so true that, you know, we do enjoy our own homes and, and the things that we like is, is what we like. So uh, I can definitely relate to that. And I am a grandpa myself, so I'm positive my grandkids probably feel the same way you know they love me but there's probably things like you know we don't really want to listen to more pink floyd grandpa or something like that right so this was a fun story well i enjoyed so much reading all your stories and personally participating in this assignment and um i hope that this quarterly schedule that i'm starting to do is going to work with you i think we have really good participation this time uh, because we haven't hadn't done it for months but prior and uh, perhaps I'm hoping that this uh, quarterly schedule will be frequent enough that doing this four times a year will satisfy our needs to be creative and share our work in this venue but at the same time it won't be so burdensome that we have to do it every month so that's kind of my idea so autumn 2019 assignment is going to be coming up in the next few weeks i'll be giving that assignment out so keeping in mind of course autumn goes from what september to <laughs> december so december 21st is when it turns into winter it's already cold here probably snowing anyways so look forward to the autumn 2019 assignment coming up I, again i really appreciate all your participation in this project and you know as i was uh reading my wife's piece that she wrote I was really thinking because uh, she had a few questions about proofreading and I was realizing you know that's interesting you know because most of us who aren't in school anymore we generally don't have an opportunity to really write formally and so these kind of assignments I hope are valuable to you guys for that sake alone right being able to uh, exercise our writing muscles and uh, dusting off our grammar and our sentence structure and thinking, oh yeah, this is how this works, and it's really fun, right? Getting out there, putting words on paper, being creative, and I hope that is important to you guys. Stay creative, and until next time, have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye.